Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is now the last session of our conference, and a uh, warm welcome, of course, to you all, and warm welcome to our panelists who are all known to you. This is the kind of uh, the wrap-up session where everything can be said and nothing can be said, and so I'll try to, uh, the one thing I'll try to do is to get us out of here by 6.15. There are people who would like to be leaving, and it would be nice to be able to have a really focused kind of contribution. Uh, given that uh, we're now 10 minutes behind, I shall cut out my opening remarks, and so, no, no, I'll give them as closing ones. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that one. Uh, so, um, first of all, uh, let us start on my right with Anne. Uh, you're well known to everybody here uh, as chair of ESPAS. Superb job, great conference. Over to you, please, for closing comments. Well, first of all, I mean, it's, uh, I need to thank everyone. I know it's been, uh, it's, uh, you've spent a lot of time with us, and we are just uh, deeply grateful to all the contributions, not just for your time, but it's exactly what Ricardo said earlier. We learn a tremendous amount uh, from you, and I think we always go away from the annual conference very inspired and, uh, and uh, very much uh, looking forward uh, to the following year. However, I will say that, of course, next year will be a different kind of year. And before I say something about that, I, I just wanted to make two, two quick points um, on maybe going back to the previous discussion earlier today on, um, on what is needed. I remember when I started, um, one of the first pieces of advice that I gave uh, to um, the president that I serve, President Juncker, was honesty. And um, I was then very pleased when in his first State of the Union address, uh, it was actually titled Time for Honesty. And uh, the reason I say that is, uh, goes back to something that uh, Franz Timmerman said yesterday that European politics has been very paternalistic. Um, and so we have given the impression to citizens that somehow we can, you know, we can shield them from realities in the world. And that's why I think that the financial crisis, the 2008 financial crisis, and also the 2015 refugee crisis was so detrimental to us because essentially it was exposed that we couldn't deliver and we couldn't ultimately shield uh, citizens from realities. And that's why I think what is called for is just a different discourse with citizens, not pretending that we have all the answers or that we uh, can protect them from everything. And I mean, what I have been trying in, in, in my speeches is um, not go and give a laundry list of what the EU is doing in a given uh, policy field, but I tell people, I bring you into my world, the world of public policy, and these are the challenges, and these are some of the options, and, and engage them in a dialogue about whatever it is that I'm speaking about and extrapolating from the future and somehow trying to, to also inspire them to become active and not just be sort of passive recipients of public policy. And I have to say that that has worked uh, remarkably well for me, so I wanted to share this with you as a best practice, uh, is maybe to move away a little bit from the paternalistic policies. We know everything, and we have the data, and maybe more to honesty, because I think we live in such a period of disruption that anyone who would say we can, you know, we can tell you what's going to happen or we can protect you from everything, I mean, is frankly not telling the truth. So honesty, I wanted to throw in there. The second thing, it was remarkable to me how much we spoke about emotion and, and then how actually um, I myself became very emotional. And, um, and what I have noticed as well is that the emotions run, it's, it's a time of emotion. People are more emotional. And uh, in Europe, where I have seen people become very engaged and emotional, is when I speak about democracy, because I think that people are realizing that, um, I said it yesterday, our democracy has been hacked. It is exposed to, um, to threats like never before. And, uh, and we were saying how you know, the, the lack of emotion um, is sort of a problem, but I think that as you are at the cusp of losing something, 
that you may have taken for granted, but that is actually at the end of the day very precious to you, that may trigger very positive emotions. That's at least my hope. And uh, from whenever I have tested it in my speeches, it is really, really something that is on people's minds and that we can engage them with and that unleashes very positive emotions because even though we say people are so pessimistic about the future, there's actually a lot that at least many Europeans like about their present life. And the freedom that we have and the tolerance and the diversity, that is really important to us. So I wanted to throw in these two terms, honesty and emotion, as something maybe to, uh, to give us something to think about as we leave uh, the, um, the event uh, today. The last thing I will say is uh, 2019 is a period of change. Um, and uh, I will uh, just uh, wanted to say that I think um, I will leave uh, to my successor an ESPAS uh, that is in very good shape, that is very dynamic, and that is full of life, and uh, I am sure that that will continue, and I want all of you to continue to engage uh, with ESPAS, and I certainly will in whatever capacity uh, I, I, I will be in going forward, and just really from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anne, for that uh, very reflective contribution. You've done more than anybody to uh, ensure that the stability of this particular network and it's also European and global reach has actually come into being. So all the great uh, thanks, not from me, but from everybody for everything that you've done. I don't think we're going to lose you yet, so that's it's okay. Klaus, okay. <laughs> uh, over to you, please, uh, as the next contribution. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, the issue of our panel is ESPAS 2019 and beyond. That raises first the question, what is our work about? And I would say our work is about which future to avoid. We don't try to find out about the future perspectives to accept it. We try to find out about scenarios in order to avoid them. Because uh, this is not, uh, we are not in an area of contemplation. Uh, we are working for political institutions who have decision-making power, both legislative and in other areas. So I would say ESPAS is about to clarify which future to avoid. And that part of the future we would like to avoid, unfortunately, is becoming bigger. Uh, into these days around us, we see Russia very aggressive with Ukraine. We see features of confessional war in the Islamic world. If you just take Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, it's less clear whether the United States is still wanting to play the global leadership we've been profiting from since 1945. And also until those days, uh, the, the clouds and insecurities of Brexit are hanging over us. And um, we could easily prolong this list with a look inside the European Union or into our member countries. So the question is, uh, under those changed circumstances, how can we preserve the possibility of Europeans to decide on their own future? Or if you want to put it in more grandiose words, how to secure strategic autonomy? And that strategic autonomy can partially be secured through alliances, but then those alliances need to be solid and need to deliver. But where they don't deliver anymore, or where there's a gap anyhow, the European Union has to fill that gap by own capacity. And that own capacity has to be built up. We are no longer just a legislative union. We have to become also an executive union. And that's a major challenge that's going into an area where we've really never been. And that means we have to backcast from the future we want to avoid. And we have to determine what needs to be done over the next 10 years in order to arrive at a better place. And 10 years sounds very long, but in fact it's only two legislatures away. It's the next one, 2019 to 2024, and it's 2024 to 2029. Which means that if we miss the crucial moment of the next legislature, we've missed already half the time span. 
And that shows us that 2019 will be an absolutely crucial year. The European Council will come up with its uh, leadership agenda in probably June this year. The European, June 2019, the European Parliament surely will make an agreement with the next Commission President elect, not only on his election, but also on content, what should be achieved over the next five years. And I'm sure that also inside the European Commission's uh, deep thinking is going on, what should be on the agenda over the next five years. So 2019 is not only crucial because of the distribution of power in the system, but also if we don't want to miss that opportunity to change the future into one which is more acceptable for European citizens. So what does it mean for ESPAS and how should we go from here? My impression is that ESPAS has made enormous progress, that we've become very solid, but the question nevertheless is, should these annual conferences just be an event in time, or could there be a cooperation which is more permanent? Uh, I know that many of you are already co uh, cooperating and providing, for example, expertise to Orbis. I think that's excellent. It's become a reference site really in this area. But the question is, when it comes, for example, for the ESPAS report or other think pieces, couldn't, be, couldn't this be something where the ESPAS community could be invited to contribute to on a more ongoing basis, so that this is not an event which is happening once every year, but that this becomes a more permanent cooperation for all those, at least, who are interested in that cooperation. That's an idea I would at least like to take uh, away from this conference uh, for our future debates. Well, thank you very much, Klaus. I mean, in your position as sec chair of this institution where we are today, your involvement in ESPAS has been nothing less than remarkable in your convictions of where it's headed and always to be imaginative in looking at the positive side where they say the glass is half full rather than half empty has always been extremely welcome. So thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, Jim, might I ask you to come next as deputy sec chair of the council? Thank you very much, James. I would like start by saying that the people who are far more married than I have in creating and running ESPAS are the people sitting uh, to my right. Um, uh, I admire all of you for having such stamina. I thought there'd be a completely empty room tonight, so <laughs> I'm a bit nervous now about what I'm going to tell you. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is that ESPAS, as Klaus has said, has matured to some extent. I mean, can always be better, but I think it is now something uh, which is worthwhile. Now the trick will be to link it up with policy making and policy decision making. Uh, and that is, as Klaus said, uh, a very important thing for next year because 2019 will have seen an institutional overhaul in the European Union. That is the moment where you can inject ideas in there and uh, we will indeed at the European Council in June uh, adopt a new strategic agenda for the next five years. So any ideas which uh, uh, are developed here will be useful. It is the time to develop a new narrative and also, like uh, Matt Burroughs said, to question all the assumptions, move forward. A few quick things on what I heard or read, rather, over the last two days. The first one, uh, it is in the nature of conferences of this type that you tend to talk a lot about worries. You know, sometimes it sounds a bit like doom and gloom, and I think that's entirely normal because, as Klaus said, we want to avoid bad things happening. But at the same time, I think uh, it's the times we're living is also a time of opportunity. I think it was Cherry who, at the dinner yesterday, told me that the Chinese character for uh, risk and opportunity is the same or very close. I forgot. I think that's very interesting. Uh, I would also point to the very interesting lecture by Anna Rosling. Uh, now, uh, uh, Anne, you mentioned the question of emotions, and I share your point of view, but only up to the point where emotions do not make disappear facts. Uh, uh, so sometimes I have the impression, including on our own decision-making in the European Union on foreign policy, for instance, sometimes a shallow emotionalism takes over, uh, and that can be dangerous. But uh, 
The second remark is, uh, people talk a lot about populism. It's not a term I like very much, but so let's say inverted commas, uh, populism, uh, how to address it. Uh, I think, uh, and again, it's very important what Rosling said, I don't think direct democracy is the answer in my view, uh, uh, because again, it plays on the instincts too. There's no filter. At the same time, and we are talking a lot in Europe about participatory uh, democracy, I think there is something new to be invented. Uh, one word on the power of words. I think it was Radek Sikorsky, but also Franz Timmermans who mentioned this. Uh, we have to be a bit careful not to leave the ground to people who use words uh, in a very uh, 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 negative way. For instance, the elites have taken over or the Brussels bureaucrats. Now, of course, we are bureaucrats, but the way it's being presented, uh, or to say there is a huge democratic deficit in the European Union. I dispute that very much. So the power of words is important. And again, discussing about all of things is very useful. Uh, we enter into a new world of digital cyber intelli uh, artificial intelligence. It's very clear that this is a huge challenge for Europe. Uh, we are behind in terms of networks, in terms of service providers, in terms of data. Uh, we have regulation on data, but uh, that's good. And I'm not at all against it, but we also need the data and the free flow of data. So this is a huge challenge for us. Uh, uh, um, and I thought what Lord Martin Rees had to say was very interesting. One thing is interesting for Europeans, uh, and that is he said there is a excessive attention to small risks. That is something I share very much. It's very European. Uh, we have this strange theory, zero risk. Well, if you want zero risk, you better stay at home and then you die of a heart attack in your own bed. So uh, I hate this term. And if you go for a strategy of zero risk, you increase the real risk, is my way. So I thought that was very interesting. It's obvious that artificial intelligence, climate change, and maybe the two seen together as a, are huge uh, 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 challenges where I think the European Union has uh, to bring something to the table. My last remark is, and this is based on the dinner which you hosted yesterday. It was a dinner about uh, Europe's role in a multipolar world. Uh, the world is multipolar. I have always been convinced of that since uh, for the last 10 years. When I said so in Washington in 2003, I was nearly thrown out of the room. Because they said, why are you against the transatlantic relationship? I said, I'm not at all against the transatlantic relationship. But uh, the world will be multipolar. And I want us to be a, a pole, the European Union, in that. The question, of course, is uh, the rhetoric has changed after Trump and Brexit in Europe. At the European Council, it's very clear. Uh, the leaders, uh, if you listen to what Mrs. Merkel said, but all the other leaders, is we have to show that we're going to make this work. The, we have to take responsibility and all that. The question, of course, is how, because from the rhetoric to uh, deeds, it's sometimes uh, a difficult route. Uh, we cannot just wait, as far as transatlantic relations are concerned, for uh, uh, the Americans to come back to their former behavior. I, maybe they will, maybe they won't. I don't know. Matt has interesting things to say about that. Regardless of that, we have to know what we want, and we have to be resilient and strong. That concerns trade, where we are actually investing a lot now, uh, uh, agreements with Japan, with Singapore, with Mexico. I would hope to have one with Mercosur as well. Canada, of course, not to forget them. So we are going, we're doing that. At the same time, I must say, we also have to draw the lessons from uh, what goes on around Iran and the secondary sanctions of the Americans. I think the um, Europeans, this is a long-term project. They have to strengthen Europe. They have to strengthen their resilience uh, so that when they tell their companies they can do business with a certain country, that it's not a third, a different country, a third country deciding that they cannot do it. Uh, digital, I mentioned before, defense, it's obvious that uh, defense, uh, NATO remains important uh, in the, uh, for our collective security, there's no question about that. At the same time, I think there is an obvious need for the European Union to step up its uh, contribution, its autonomy, its strategic autonomy. It's good for NATO if NATO develops and the same situation arises, and if something happens, it's also a kind of reinsurance. So I think we should uh, definitely uh, build on that. My very last remark in this context is uh, uh, lots of people have talked about values, and it is true. We pride ourselves on our values and all that. I think, incidentally, we should not necessarily preach as much as we do uh, sometimes, because uh, 
it's very clear, and the last years have shown, that values is good and it underpins what we are doing. But you cannot just conduct a foreign policy with values. You need a good dose of real politic. And I think that's what the Union has learned over the last years. And where the European Council has had to step up to the great, we had so many crises that if you just appeal to values and even to rules, uh, you're not going to defend the values nor the rules. So I think this is, for me, a very important lesson. Uh, it is very clear that I haven't talked about the world, but China, India, many things are moving. I think the Union, I think there is actually a demand out there that the Union does things. Sometimes people are a bit disappointed because we don't live up to the expectations. We'll have to change that. Uh, so I think ESPAS can help, can contribute to that, and it will certainly continue, and I'm quite convinced of that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and I'm sure that report next June that you are writing is going to be full with lots of good ideas, so thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Christian, uh, over to you, please, for the last comment from the panel. Thank you, James. Um, I mean, I, I, I uh, hardly need to um, stress or impress on you the importance of foresight as a contribution to our work. Um, it is essential, it's more challenging, and because we're so busy, we often haven't got the time or we forget to lift our heads uh, above the fray and try to look a bit longer term um, rather than chasing after the rapid changes that we see around us. But doing that is very much essential if we want to move beyond reacting to events and shape them. I come to this from the foreign policy angle of the External Action Service, and it's very clear that the work we do together with colleagues in ESPAS and with all of you in the broader policy and foresight community is an essential contribution to our efforts to shape and develop um, a European foreign policy that makes sense. Um, it's increasingly challenging and increasingly necessary uh, in the ever more unpredictable environment around us, in our strategic environment. But that, although it makes it challenging, also makes it all the more necessary to be prepared for whatever events will come. As Klaus said, we need to look ahead to see what we want to avoid. Um, in the external sphere, often we can't avoid them. Um, Harold Macmillan, phrased it very nicely when he ruminated on leaving office and was asked what was the most challenging task he had had as prime minister. And he said, events, my dear boy, <laughs> events. And that is what we're dealing with. And we have to find the appropriate way of handling them. In preparing the union for um, this um, changeable, complex, um, often contested world around us, um, the High Representative launched um, a little over two years ago now, the EU Global Strategy. That was um, an attempt at a time of great upheaval within the Union. It um, sadly coincided almost to the week with the British vote uh, on leaving the Union. So upheaval within the Union and outside it around the world the strategy has given us a compass to navigate choppy waters. Um, it sets clearly what our interests are, what the principles and priorities that we should develop are, that should guide us as we pursue our policies and develop the tools we need to take this forward. But that is not a static document. It needs to be tested, it needs to be reviewed, it needs to be updated. In doing that, the broader work of ESPAS, the broader reflection on our own societies and contextualizing also global trends is an essential tool. The, the concepts Klaus mentioned, the strategic autonomy that we are working together with colleagues um, in the Commission in the Council, in Member States, and with colleagues in the Parliament to see how we can develop further for the EU, also links to another core concept in the global strategy, which is that of resilience. 
that is resilience of our societies and how we can help others develop theirs. The ability to withstand shocks, to rebound from them or to adapt to changing circumstances more quickly. That is at the core of what we seek to achieve for European foreign policy for ourselves and in working with partners to strengthen their capacity. A core element of this, um, several colleagues already touched on it, is not to lose sight of what we believe are our fundamental values and principles. Open, accountable societies, um, robust state structures, um, strong participation of citizens, strong dialogues. You may note that I'm avoiding the word democracy because it tends to be misinterpreted, but of course that is for us at the core of it. Um, so this is about keeping our structures running, but also about supporting our citizens, um, encouraging them to take a critical look on the societies they live in, our own societies, to be able to tell facts from deep fakes uh, and give them, share with them the value compass to be able to assess developments around them. This also means investing in early warning, have preparedness, develop our preparedness to focus on preventing crises, uh, addressing challenges as they arise, and seizing opportunities. For all this work, I think what we do in ESPAS and in the wider foresight community is both enriching for us and incredibly useful in translating that into concrete policy elements and policy recommendations as we take our work forward. That is, therefore, in its different dimensions, a very important contribution to our ability to formulate a European foreign policy and the policies that we can extend to partners uh, to help strengthen their position um, in um, the global community. An important element in this work is the ESPAS report, which has been referred to. We're now preparing the update version of it. I think this will be a hugely important contribution for the reflection that will be necessary next year on the further steps of the Union as we renew the institutions with and after the European Parliament elections. Um, one last word coming back to the global strategy, but which links to ESPAS as well. Um, it highlights very strongly the intrinsic interconnection between internal and external policy spheres, how they um, interact, how they influence each other, how they depend on each other. Foreign policy cannot be left to diplomats. It has to be taken forward in a much broader context. That again is why we believe that ESPAS and the work with all of you is such an essential feature uh, of what we do. And we look forward to doing that, continuing to do it together. Let me end with one last word to thank the fellow members of the ESPAS steering committee and above all the organizers of this conference. I think the ESPAS conference for us is the highlight, the annual highlight of our cooperation and it's thanks to this important work and the contributions that all of you have made um, that we've seen ESPAS developing and going from strength to strength over the years. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christian. It reminds me uh, of the comments that you made as I make uh, two, two or three concluding remarks and then we'll be out is that actually the whole period of the existence of ESPAS has now been a 10-year period since we've actually been in crisis mode since the Great Recession. 
And so it's a remarkable achievement that this is an extraordinary, it's a unique interinstitutional cooperation which you see on the panel this evening of the, ex of the contributions. We've always done this at the end of a conference, but it's become quite a, a tradition that uh, we can show that we're very much together in looking forward to seeing where we're going to go to next. So in the terms of being able to assemble this network together, obviously the thanks are to those who have uh, contributed to this superb conference, both in the Commission yesterday and in the Parliament today, to Ricardo, Danielle, and all your staff and all your people. Thank you very much indeed. I think a big round of applause is really good. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, as part of that, um, we've already been able to see, and thank you, Anne, for all the leadership that you provided over this period. It's never easy. We have a million things to do a day, and I guess you feel like that so when you say, which one am I going to tackle first? But uh, there's a kind of piece of advice which I've always had, saying you always take the crocodile nearest the canoe, and you're therefore always safe <laughs> that you won't then be survived. But I think that everything you have done to provide this regular kind of leadership has been critical in the way in which we've been able to do so. So now we're in this process where you are very well informed about the process of this report, which will be produced in March next year. The think pieces are going out on August. This is a first that I've never seen in the European institutions where pieces that we're making informally are put out into a public domain so that people can contribute. So very strongly we're urged to be able to contribute to this process. But I think that uh, looking forward to the future, we had a wonderful contribution today in particular from Lord Martin Rees, which you referred to as well, was uh, saying, how do you distribute this stuff out? Because I think, Ricardo, when you showed all these kind of documents, uh, we've been extraordinarily productive, but if we actually wanted to know who had actually read them and where they'd actually gone and what kind of influence they'd had, I think we need to have an honest kind of assessment, and Klaus, you mentioned this very much, of saying, well, where do we go to next? We've done a 10-year establishment, we got the ideas, but actually we have a huge opportunity in the next 12 months to be able to feed these ideas out. So it uh, may be that what we need to do is to formulate a communication strategy as we move into 2019 to know where we'd like to be over the next 12 months, who would like to get which information for what purpose and how are we going to do that. Because it did strike me, Klaus, it's actually very strange. We are here in the European Parliament and we therefore have access to all the political people you actually want to be able to distribute it out onto the networks. And I think that that would be a matter for some reflection. And taking Matt, and my last word, as uh, everybody knows, he's been my kind of mentor in this particular process since this off-the-cuff remark in the end of 2008, why don't we do something together? And I said, well, we're not going to be able to do, <laughs> we haven't got anything to do anything with you guys in Europe. Now we have that. And it seems that your question that you raise of how do you put ideas of strategic foresight into policy making is the key because you want to make sure you have a real product and a real result. So we might maybe think of having a platform, a regular platform, which can be used in the parliament for people to be able to come to, led by political side, because that's obviously something that they would want to be able to do. But I think it's an idea which we need to consider because we are living in exceptional times. We want to be able to win the battle against the populace. We want to be able to win the battle of our society and of the values which we stand for. So could I thank all the panelists very much indeed, Anne, Klaus, Jim, and Christian, for everything that you've given to the SBS process, particularly in the last few months, to make this such a successful event. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you next time, wherever that might be. But I should think it's about this time next year, and we'll be expecting you to be present, Anne, too. Yes. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>